Thanks to CuriosityStream and Nebula for sponsoring this video. Stick around to the end for a whopping 26% discount. And it's actually a different effect that I'm getting on my screen because of the oh, that's so cool. refresh rate. <laughs> Science! Ah! <laughs> Lots of people follow this YouTube channel because of the vlogs I made during my PhD in atmospheric physics at the University of Exeter. Unfortunately, however, I had to graduate at some point, and that necessarily meant the end of my videos showing what doing a PhD was like. However, there are lots of people out there doing interesting PhD projects, and so in this video series I'm spending a few days with a new researcher each episode, showing you what their life is like, learning a bit about them, and learning about the topic of their thesis. This episode I'm spending some time with Kat, who's studying for a PhD at the University of Bath and unusually is a regular streamer on Twitch, inspiring the next generation of math students. It's Freshers Week here at the University of Bath, but I'm not here for any of these freshers behind me, I'm here for a PhD student, someone who is studying something that's actually very similar to what I was doing my PhD on, fluid mechanics. But whilst I was looking at the big scale stuff in the atmosphere, she's looking at something a lot smaller. I'm Katie Phillips, but I go by Kat. Uh, I am a second year PhD student at the University of Bath, but I'm in my third year of um, the SAMBA CDT here, which is the Statistical Applied Mathematics at Bath uh, Centre of Doctoral Training. And my PhD research is in uh, theoretical fluid dynamics of uh, impacting droplets. So picture, I'm going to call it a bath, but just a very large body of water with a small droplet above it and the droplets falling. So you can think of rain in a puddle, you can think of in the bath splashing, big body of water and then a droplet. A lot of um, current models, so um, whenever they look at this in, for other reasons, you have a droplet that falls. If it has enough speed, it bounces. So you get, you've seen rain bounce and it disappears. And the models at the minute just kind of only focus on the droplet and the water, because if you ask someone, what am I looking at? They would say those two things, but we don't live in a vacuum, so we have air as well. And the air is actually in like incredibly crucial to the system because the air is the thing that is stopping those two bodies of water from coalescing, mixing, because as soon as they touch, it disappears and it, it joins the, the bath. So what my research is, is kind of considering this air layer, like actually putting it into the equations, like looking at what happens, how the pressure moves through the air. Does the air like jettison out of the way? Does it stay there? And you actually end up with this very thin band of air, this entire process. Um, and I'm trying to use theoretical and numerical like modeling to figure out what happens there. This probably sounds rather abstract, but Kat had a low-tech demonstration of what this looks like practically, and some interesting things that can happen when you mess with that bath. So in our normal system we have just a falling droplet. There you go. Um, but that is quite boring, so what we can do is stick our bath on top of a car speaker. So we put it on top of a car speaker because we want to control the frequency of it being shaken vertically. So I've attached it to an app on my phone that has a frequency modulator and that allows me to control how um, much we're shaking and how fast we're shaking the bath. There's a critical frequency at which we can generate surface waves so we can start seeing the effect of shaking the bath. Um, but below that, so we're subcritical, we get enough air energy to keep the droplets bouncing, but not so much to massively affect their behavior. As we increase the frequency, we start getting more chaos in the system and we can get moving droplets. And then beyond that, again, when we hit critical frequency, where we generate Faraday waves on the free surface. Obviously, we could keep going, and if we actually go well beyond um, critical frequency, we actually get so much energy in the system that it can generate droplets. So they are called um, Faraday generated bouncing droplets. The thing that's really interesting about this is the fact that you have um, what's called pilot wave phenomena happening. So you have the droplet, which is essentially a particle, um, and you have this um, the free surface acting as a wave field that's kind of dictating the movement and behavior of the droplet. So as the droplet bounces, it's interacting with the waves that it's generated previously or the waves generated by other droplets, and that dictates where it goes next. What more serious experimental setups have been able to do is recreate quantum phenomena, such as the double slit experiment. So you can recreate the double slit experiment using this setup by putting two walls submerged underneath um, the free surface. And as the waves on the top of the surface move around, they'll interact with the walls underneath and you can yeah, get this double slit experiment recreated. So my work is uh, trying to 
describe what happens in the air and the pressure transfer between the droplet and the bath. Um, so hopefully by the end of the PhD, I will have a system that um, feeds into models that describe uh, the walking and bouncing behavior. Um, so I fit in on the micro scale where they model the macro scale. At the start of our thesis, they're encouraging everyone when they write up to put in a, a responsible research and innovation um, section to be like, why is your research useful? You can't just do abstract maths for no reason anymore. It's like, what is this going to feed into? Bigger models, it can feed into like oceanography because um, obviously you've got rain and evaporation happening. It can feed into um, some really cool theoretical problems. And there's like loads of, and just anything that has a very thin layer of water or any water with anything impacting on it, you can have boats impacting on like waves. You still get this thin layer of air protecting it for us up to a certain point. And my, what I'm doing will hopefully better those models and make them more accurate without being too heavy. Now, if you've seen some of my PhD vlogs or coding streams on twitch.tv forward slash Dr. Simon Clark, then you'll know that the atmosphere is described using fluid mechanics. In fact, it's described using the exact same equation that CAT uses, the Navier-Stokes equation, just with different assumptions made and so different terms in the equation ignored. So CAT and I geeked out on a whiteboard talking about how you model the atmosphere and how you model a water droplet and what the differences are. You know, for atmospheric stuff, obviously, well, most of the time you are interested in time dependence. Yes. But like, actually, a lot of the time you can ignore it and you just okay. find like a balance, like a geostrophic balance, for example. Mm. But like, that's fair. We're both on the same page. Yep, Advection term. Yep. Absolutely important. It's something that's been killing me in my own climate <laughs> model. This then becomes the, well, actually, and you're also missing a term from atmospheric science, which is the Coriolis term. So you'd have, you know, like <laughs> a, um, oh God, this is where I get the maths from. <laughs> So that, yeah, there's a rotational term. There's there. a rotational term there. And, and then in, you'd also have, this would be your gradient force in terms of just your overall pressure gradient. Okay. And that also is probably the most important term in terms of actually forcing, you know, a domain. Yeah. Um, and then this is your viscosity term. Yes. So that can get in the bin. That is <laughs> no, gone. The, the atmosphere is inviscid. There's no, <laughs> imagine if the atmosphere was viscous. So in, my air, air layer, I would have inviscid flow. Mm. And in my uh, liquid, I now consider small viscosity. So obviously, if it's too viscous, um, you don't get necessarily the right surface tension into play. Right. So the crucial thing about this is it's absolutely tiny. If you have like a large body impact, it, it's a different system. You'd have um, gravity waves taking over. But because this happens, this is like my millimeters, micrometers, like tiny stuff. Um, it's all capillary waves, so it's surface tension that's like the driving force of why you get this bounce. Right. Um, so that can stay, please. Okay, um, <laughs> hang on. Yeah. Have you watched any of those art restoration YouTube channels? Oh, yeah. Like Baumgartner Restoration. This that's is the so maths good. version of that. <laughs> so what's interesting to me, at least, is that like, it's the same equations that get used in atmosphere in this kind of context, every fluid mechanic context, but because of the assumptions you make, no two field uses the exact same equations because you're binning, you know, different terms. Yeah. But like the actual universality of the equation is just really beautiful. Yes. And it's one of the things I love about fluids is because you kind of, no matter what physical system you're given, you start from the same thing and then you can look at it and start just making it nicer and nicer to play with until mm. eventually you have an equation that is solvable by some sort of numerical scheme. You hope. <laughs> one day, one day. One of the things when I was finishing up my undergrad masters was I was looking through some of my old notes from like when I was a small child in school, like year seven, 11 year, year old or so. Um, and we found this mock interview that we did to like prepare us for big school. And it was like, what do you want to be when you're older? And I put researcher. As an 11 year old child, I put researcher. I want to keep learning. And I don't think I ever really lost that. I think it definitely moved around a bit as I grew up. And, you know, the, I, th I think part of it was I wanted to be an archaeologist or I wanted to be Doctor Who. And, you know, the, the reason what I wanted to research kind of changed a bit. But I really like learning. I find I get very excited whenever something works. <laughs> I'm also a STEM ambassador. So I do um, outreach stuff targeted towards children. And I remember in my training for that, they brought up this stat of the number of people interested in maths at different key stages. Um, so you look at like five-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 16-year-olds. And one thing is there's a noticeable, noticeable drop. I think there's something 
inherently wholesome about small children. If you're like, do you like this? They go, yeah. They don't know what they're talking about. But what was interesting is you hit the 11 year old mark and suddenly it goes from pretty equal split between the genders to a massive drop. And it's even more shocking when you hit like 16 year olds. And then suddenly by the time you're hitting 18 year olds and like how many of you are gonna go do, you know, STEM or maths at university, you're hitting the like 5% mark. And I think that's a really big shame. And I think it's a, it's a societal issue because something is happening along there that is making girls and women feel like they don't, they can't go into it. I was really fortunate that I had an incredible maths GCSE teacher uh, who was female and she just completely inspired me. I loved the way that she tackled all the problems. She made classes really fun. And then again, I was very fortunate at university. It was actually my third year fluid dynamics lecturer, um, Dr. Katerina Cowery, who just completely inspired me. I just, she was so great. She was an incredible teacher, which is not something you can say about every academic because the teaching and the, the lecturing side of things is very different to being an incredible researcher. She was so great about the way she spoke about things. And I genuinely don't know if I'd have done as much or as well in my undergrad and like wanted to do as much now and wanted to share that as much if it hadn't been for her. Um, so I know I was very, very fortunate to have those very, you know, wonderful female influences in my life. Um, also my mum, because I have to say that, because she's great. We'll put that in. <laughs> now, as a matter of fact, I actually have some history with the uni here because I grew up about 15 minutes that way. And obviously as a kid, you don't have much reason to come up to the university, but my parents brought me here to learn how to cycle. So my very first ride ever on a bike without stabilizers was down this path, which is a very shallow incline. So I came careening down here at what I thought was tremendous speed. And then I collided with a bin that used to be right where that lamppost is, face first into a rubbish bin. Apparently my parents only fished me out when they stopped laughing. And I do note that just over here, just behind you, there are some signs. Wonder, uh, wonder why those are there. As I've already mentioned, it was Freshers' Week on campus when I filmed this, which meant that there were social events happening everywhere. But one social event that was happening every week was in the maths department. So this is PhD cake. Um, every week we have one of the PhD students come in and make a cake or attempt to make a cake. Um, and it's just an excuse in the middle of the week to like get away and enjoy a break from work. Now, taking the view of the layperson here, a gathering of maths PhDs, what do you guys talk about? Um, sometimes maths, not always. We try and have a ban until one of the analysts turn up and then suddenly it's, it's pure maths all the way. The fact that the table Tables are actually whiteboards, so you can write on the tables is quite fun. Although if you do that in the pub, they get a bit angry at you. You wouldn't do a PhD if you didn't love what you do. So there is some talk on it, but there's also like sports and socials and we, you know, we're real people too. There's more than just maths. What? <laughs> Shocking, I know. This is the bit that gets me in trouble with my supervisor for not spending nine to five on the PhD. I do uh, tutoring for the university. So I teach the first year undergrads, get them into thinking about uh, calculus and differential equations. I then do private tutoring. I then also uh, help out at my local yoga studio because when everything moved online for them, there was a bit of a panic. We haven't been able to do it over lockdown, um, but there is a group on campus called the Bathematicians. Excellent name, I know. So they're a group that I kind of use the STEM ambassadorship for, all my training with that, and we are hoping to be able to go back into schools and do outreach days. I then have a Twitch account, Cat Does Maths, where I kind of take everything that I've learned from my teaching and from my PhD and kind of shove it into the general like public audience and say, hey, look at this, this isn't scary. Maths is actually quite cool, I promise. And this is how I originally met Kat through Twitch. In case you don't know, Twitch is a website where creators live stream and interact with a chat in real time. Originally, it was just used by creators playing video games, but now has a community of streamers cooking, playing role-playing games, and studying. We both do educational streams and both believe that Twitch can be used to great effect in education. It's such a, an untapped potential for academia to kind of bridge the gap, like showing my PhD research as I'm doing it, it's not scary, well, it might look scary right now, but it's not scary because you can see me sitting there and working through it and you can ask questions and you can talk to academics and it 
removes this like stigma that academia is this scary building filled with old white men that aren't going to do anything except glower at you, you know? Like maths isn't blackboards and grumpy people. There's a lot of that, but it's not exclusively. <laughs> and yeah, I think Twitch is this beautiful like opportunity to actually have honest communication with people on what it's actually like. To see how Kat went about this, I joined her for one of her streams. So what are we doing here? What, what stream are we doing? Okay, so I call them Maths Office Hours, which is basically my attempt at um, shoving as much maths into the public domain as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so at the minute we've been going through past papers of A-level maths. Mm. One really nice comment I had once from a follower that was just, they didn't understand it in school and they hated it in school. But after watching my stream, they finally got it and they really appreciated it. And I was like, that's, it's, that's great. That's nice. It's not yeah. just people with like math Stockholm syndrome. No, <laughs> no. Hello. <laughs> There's two of us. Um, Can we rotate the screen? Now? Yeah, like, I don't, do, uh, do what you like. There we go. <laughs> it's not, it just, I'll just cut me off the corner. There we go. covering my face <laughs> there we go that's just a bit better okay i fixed it um should we should we do some maths oh yeah so the first one that we've got is given that y is 2x squared minus 5x find dy dx from first principles we want to find this gradient so whenever we want to find um a line between two things we do rise over run so if we introduce the function at this point is f of x plus delta x okay so that is then, wherever there's an x here, we now sub in x plus delta x. So that's gonna be not plus equals to two times, this is now representing our x, so that goes in there, so x plus delta x squared, minus five lots of that, so x plus delta x squared plus two x delta x plus delta x squared. <laughs> Thank you for agreeing with me. I can see you nodding. Uh, yes, correct. Okay. But don't we need to divide by something? We're getting there! And it's minus, minus five. five. Would you like to continue or oh, sorry, so, <laughs> so now we, we, basically we then have to s subtract from this. We're, effectively, you're, you're taking this expression and assuming that delta x is zero. Nearly, but you need to subtract on the top first. But no, no, that's what I mean. Oh, but we're yes. subtracting, so effectively we're subtracting 2x squared minus 5x yes. from this. So that just leaves us with the terms that have the delta x in. I'm going to write it like this. Okay. If you have to. It does say find dy dx, so I'd mark that wrong if I was marking this <laughs> But <homework>. we defined... <laughs> so because you defined... Uh, so if anything, I'd say that's your fault. Why? Because you, you substituted uh, y for a f. Yeah, so y is a function of f, so... Didn't, didn't write that down anywhere, though, did you? What did I just highlight? Oh, sorry, this tiny little bit on yes! the Yes! When I'm Not... defining... This is the setup. This is the maths. This is the... So we set dy dx formally to be the limit as x, delta x tends to zero, f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x, which in this case is 4x minus 5. <laughs> Goodbye! Please end the stream. I'm ending it. I'm ending it. <laughs> that was <Like> chaos. That. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. That was complete chaos, but like, it was really fun. Mm. And like... <laughs> It's one of these things where, like, if people are enjoying themselves, mm. they learn, they stealth learn. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could do this full time, like, if say, you know, something miraculous happens and, you know, suddenly gain huge numbers of followers and it becomes viable as a full time thing, do you think you'd want to do this over academia? That's difficult, because fundamentally I want to do both. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, I feel like outreach is so 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 important and full-time science communicators and content creators are absolutely invaluable to getting people into it but then i also have this like bit of me that loves what i do within academia but also feels like for representation wise it's all well and good saying you should do this but then i wouldn't be doing it myself yeah and like <laughs> if i did ever give up academia for something like this it's because this is easier and i can curate my environment much better and I feel like because I love my research and I love like teaching, lecturing, as well as messing around for hours on this, 
I don't want to give that up for this. And I, like, I want to be one of the people when they're like, oh, you know, I have three female lecturers this year. Like, I want to be one of those. Yeah. And I want to be, like, visible, being myself, but also in an academic environment. Because I feel like it's all well and good to promote change outside of it and encourage new growth through. Like, fundamentally, that's how we're going to change the perception on academia is by the new people coming into it being themselves and being yeah. different and being a diverse group of people but that's not good if then everyone leaves at the highest level because all you're left with then is the people who have been around for ages so I, I I love this and I would want to do this at the very least more seriously part-time but I have always said I want to do academia and outreach as like a mix of both you're you're becoming the female lecturer that you had at undergraduate yes like, <laughs> a little bit but because it, because one lecturer can inspire even if it's two students yeah it's worth it. It's, it's, it's so expanding the representation. It. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's the goal at the very least. So some, some university, give me a job. Oh, and in case you didn't pick up on it, Kat is Welsh. And so one of the redeemable rewards on her Twitch is, well... Uh, Inversion has redeemed um, the Welsh name. Would you like to give it a go? Oh, is this the full... Right. <laughs> Someone get ready to clip this, please. <laughs> what, the nailing? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Fanfare, Wilhwin, Gil Gogri, Huyrin, Rob Huyran, Silio Gogogoch. Okay, so that was like 60% there. You oh, need okay. to be much more aggressive with the back of your throat. Fanfare, Pulfguin, Gil Gogerich, and Drobble Shanta, Silio Gogogoch. That's basically what I said. Perhaps unsurprisingly, when Kat and I got in front of a whiteboard, we geeked out enormously, and I got her to explain her work in way more detail than I could ever fit into a YouTube video. If you'd like to see a bonus video of us talking through the equations in her work, then that is available on Nebula, the educational streaming service that I co-own along with dozens of other creators. Here we upload the videos that we upload to YouTube, but with extra content and without any adverts at all. No pre-roll ads, no mid-roll ads, no ads in the videos themselves. It's just the thoughtful, educational part of YouTube with creators like Ali Abdal, Lindsay Ellis, and Jordan Harrod, but with a better viewing experience for you. You can download videos and watch them offline, and by watching a creator, you directly financially support them and help them make more content. You can get access by signing up with our partners, CuriosityStream, who curate the finest library of documentaries on the internet, such as the beautifully produced Butterfly Effect, which includes an episode on the history of fluid mechanics. They have thousands of professionally produced documentaries available at your fingertips to complement the indie-produced content on Nebula. By signing up at curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark, you get access to all these documentaries, extra content from indie creators like me on Nebula, and you also get an amazing 26% discount. It works out at $14.79 a year, or a little over $1 a month for the version of YouTube that you probably already watch, but better and with access to thousands of brain-improving documentaries. That's curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark, with thanks to CuriosityStream and Nebula for sponsoring this video. A massive thank you to Kat for being so generous with her time and allowing me to join her on her stream. I had a great time making this video and I really hope that you enjoyed watching it. If you'd like to see the previous videos in this PhD story series, then check out the playlist on screen right now, along with another suggested video. If you did enjoy the video, please do pop it a like, and if you're not subscribed, then consider subscribing to find out when I release more in this series. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.